the Dawi they found was close to death. He was emaciated, hovering on the edge of starvation, if not firmly in its grip. His face was harsh and lined, marred by what appeared to be a permanent squint, and framed by a wispy white beard he tucked into a battered leather belt. He wore crude rags that might once have been sturdy dwarf wool, and his pants were stained by sweat and viscera. His feet were over-large, even for a dwarf. Completely bare, they were cut and scratched in many places. If he'd fled his captors, he'd done it barefoot over sharp rock. Vabur offered the long beard his ale skin, and the Dawi took it gratefully. He sputtered and choked on the first pull, and then began to drink so vigorously that Vabur had to rescue the skin before it was completely empty. Not so much, ancient one. It's Zargot, he cautioned. He took a pull himself, and then looked around sheepishly at the disgusted looks on the other dwarf faces. Even Felix couldn't hide his loathing. Zargot tasted like the ruts, and tended to give you the same. What? I have a weakness for pepper ale, admitted the giant dwarf with an uncharacteristic blush. What are you called, ancient one? asked Nori Wolfheim. Balir said the dwarf. Balir, Balerson. He blinked up at the group. I'd ask if I was in the halls of Grimnir, except I can't imagine what an Ungi would be doing there. This is Felix, said Gotrek, dwarf friend and rememberer. Felix ignored Balir's slight. Judging from the look of him, the long beard had been through a lot. They gave him food from their meager stores, and after a quick meal, he pronounced himself, if not whole, then at least passable. He'd been the leader of a patrol sent into the lower vaults to investigate signs of Skaven encroachment, when that was still but a rumor. They'd run into a group of ratmen using the same tactics as the one who attacked Wolfheim's crew at the river ambush, except they didn't have Martinuk on hand to distribute Skaven masks. They'd quickly fallen victim to the gas and Balir had awoken into a nightmare. He had found himself in a tiny cell with a dozen other dwarves dressed in rags, each of them so pale and thin that their ribs shaded their bellies and their skin was like parchment stretched over bone. He didn't recognize any of them, and they spoke in heavily accented Kazalid that he had difficulty understanding. They were at the end of their physical strength and had little interest in communication, so he passed the time making and then discarding plans to escape. How long had he languished there, he didn't know, but the number of dwarves in the cell dwindled daily as Skaven guards dragged them screaming into the lower tunnel. When Balir's turn came, they took him down into the bowels of what he soon realized was a dwarf hold. The masonry was ancient and crumbling, but he recognized the quality of Dawi work. The guards brought him to a large central chamber. Many more black lad Skaven, like the ones who had ambushed Balir's team, were stationed about the room, their tails twitching occasionally as they stood at attention. At the far side of the room, there was a massive vault door, that was big enough to ride a herd of mountain ponies through at once. An intricate rune was carved in the wall above it, and on the floor below lay a pile of stinking corpses, many so badly rotten that it was impossible to tell what race they belonged to. The guards threw him to the floor in front of a Skaven shaman. Given Balir's limited comprehension of the ratman tongue, he could discern only that they called him Tazuk. And Tazuk was a fearsome sight. He wore a Dawi skull for a helmet, and, Balir realized in horror, a cape made of Dawi skin. A dozen golden loops pierced his muzzle ridge from his snout to the beady little eyes. Worst of all, the creature wore around his neck a necklace made from what Balir could assume was braided dwarf hair. The skull, beard, and cape made Tazuk look more like a dwarf than a ratman, and Balir soon guessed that that was the intention. In any other circumstance, Balir would have laughed. A skaven wanting to be a dwarf? Imagine that. One look into Tazuk's eyes, and the laughter died in his throat. He was indeed mad and it was the kind of insanity that would drive the Grey Seer to kill without any mercy or remorse. It was then that Balir knew that if he couldn't escape, he would end up just like one of the corpses in front of the vault. 
While Tazuk cursed his troops in their weird speaking tongue, Balir seized a curved knife from the belt of one of the guards and stabbed the creature in the knee. Before it could even squeal in pain, he spun and plunged his dagger into the eye of the other guard, and then bolted for the door. Luck was with him. He'd caught the assembled Skaven by surprise. Only a single black lad rat stood between him and the door. In a fair fight, Balir knew he could have defeated a guard, but he couldn't afford to waste the seconds it would take to kill it. He only had a moment before the rest of the Skaven came to their senses. Instead of engaging it, he ducked his head and charged forward, hoping to bowl it over and make an escape. The Skaven shrieked in alarm and tried to hurl itself aside, but it was too late. They crashed together. Seconds later, several distinct pops told Balir why this particular Skaven was keen to avoid him. The Ratman had been carrying dozens of gas-filled eggs, most of which had burst open when he'd fallen. Sweet-smelling gas filled the central room as Balir untangled himself from the Skaven warrior. Dark green clouds stung his eyes and burned his throat, but he was able to push onwards and soon left the gas behind. It did its work on the Skaven, though, knocking out Tazuk and much of the household guard. No pursuit was mounted for hours. The Longbeard finished his tale with a grunt. And for the first time in days, I decided to take a nap. That's when you lot showed up. Nori Wolfheim's brow wrinkled. A mad Skaven wearing dowie skin? A pile of corpses? What are we to make of this? Who knows what foul rituals the ratmen perform away from the eyes of Dawi? Answered Malbach with a shrug. Perhaps they were sacrificing prisoners to their god. Vavor Nerinson bounced the head of his mole in the palm of one hand. I knew a dwarf who wore a string of skaven ears around his neck. The Ratman could be doing the same with Dawi Bones. We're a badge of honor to them. He seemed to approve, despite the gruesomeness of the thought. Felix shook his head as the others debated the meaning of the story Balir told them. He knew far less about Ratman than the dwarves, but he couldn't imagine them leaving a pile of corpses to rot. They were rumored to eat whatever they could get, and he'd seen with his own eyes evidence that they ate their own dead. So why stay away from dwarf corpses? Could they be poisoned? That made no sense. Skaven were reputed to eat warpstone and other toxic brews that could fell even a dwarf. So if the corpses weren't poisoned, somehow the Skaven must have been prevented from approaching them. But how? Balir had mentioned the presence of a rune nearby. Can you sketch the rune you saw? He suddenly asked, interrupting the others. Quickly, he outlined his line of reasoning to the group. Of course I can, said Balir gruffly. He took a dagger from Vabur and carved his likeness in the rock dust coating the floor of the passageway. Ulgar grunted once when he was halfway through, and then again when he was done. The armory, the old runesmith muttered to himself. The armory of Karaktam. Ulgar? asked Nori Wolfheim. Do you recognize the rune? Ulgar looked up with haunted eyes. We must send for the armies of Baragvar right now. You are not serious? asked Wolfheim hesitantly. When you spoke of Karaktam, I thought, as many of you did, that it was merely a legend admitted the runesmith. But the secret to crafting the rune Balir has drawn was lost to us in the War of Vengeance. It is said that the magics involved in its creation were such that it took a dozen of the best runesmiths ever born over a hundred years to craft. But crafted they did. Over the entrance to the armory of Karaktam. What does it do? Malbach asked breathlessly. Ulgar ignored him, instead focusing on Balir. You made a mistake fleeing from the Skaven, 
the safest place for you would have been inside the armory. The rune you speak of kills any non dawi crossing the threshold. There was a moment of silence as they digested this. A rune that kills anything but a dwarf? If the secret of its creation hadn't been lost, who knew what the Dawi nations might look like today? Felix could well imagine the Dao race scrolling one over the entrance of every single hold. If I'd have been safe inside the armory, why did the Skaven bring me there? asked Balir. It wanted you to bring out whatever was inside, offered Felix. It seemed obvious to him, but the dwarves looked at him like he just suggested that Tazuk the Mad had wanted Balir to cover himself in honey and dance a jig like a cave bear. The idea that a dwarf could cooperate with any Skaven was so alien to them that they never considered it. That's why the Skaven who attacked us strove to capture, not to kill us. This Tazuk believes that there are powerful weapons locked inside the vault, and he needs dwarves to get them out. It is possible, admitted Balir. I was the last of the prisoners to be removed from the cell. Maybe they sent the others into the armory, and they were smart enough not to come out. Can Tazuk be on to something? asked Wulfheim of Ulgar. Could there be weapons still inside the armory? Ulgar shrugged. The histories do not say, but if there are, they would be among the most powerful rune weapons ever made. The dwarves of Karaktam were some of the finest runesmiths and weaponsmiths in the entire nation. Their weapons feature prominently in many of our legends. If they were to fall into the hands of any but the dwarves, it would be a disaster. If a mad skaven were to get a hold of them. By Grimnir's beard, said Wolfheim, his armored fist crashing into his palm. He stared down at the tunnel towards Karaktam, and then back the way they came. King Grundadrak must be alerted, but I won't leave poor Glorin to such a fate. We'll send our strongest warrior to Baragvar while we continue the pursuit. Gatra cursed. You mean your second strongest warrior? Felix looked up the tunnel. They'd followed a relatively straight path upriver, but before that, he remembered the twisting tunnels carved by Skaven slaves. How could anyone retrace their steps through this maze? Does anyone remember the way? he asked. They all looked at him as if he was a mad idiot. You don't? Malbach blurted out, before being elbowed into silence by Martinuk. Don't make fun of the Umgi, whispered the mercenary. Felix flushed scarlet. Of course a dwarf would remember. Navigating these kinds of tunnels was second nature to them. Vabur, said Wolfheim, ignoring Felix's outburst. It's you. Get going. The giant dwarfs crossed his arms stubbornly. I am not fleeing to the surface like a coward. Send Malbach. He doesn't even want to be here. I would dearly love to send Malbach, said Wolfheim with a roll of his eyes. But I worried the message wouldn't get through. No, it has to be you. Vabur puffed up somewhat mollified by Wolfheim's confidence in him. The white-bearded reckoner knelt in front of Balir. I wouldn't ask this if the situation was not dire, but the Ratmen have captured one of our own, and we mean to rescue him. Can you lead us back to the Karak? The Longbeard looked up at the other dwarves with suspicion that quickly gave way to weary resignation. I can, he said. Then it's settled, said Gotrek, rubbing his hands gleefully. My axe will feast on Skaven blood tonight. But the axe of Gotrek didn't feast on Skaven blood that night, nor the next. 
Valir's presence in the group both helped and hindered them. He was able to lead them around Skaven scouting parties, but despite his stubbornness, he was simply unable to match the pace they set before. Gromnir, who seemed to be the twin most versed at tracking, informed them that they were days behind the group who'd taken Glorin. Felix could only hope that the Skaven would keep the apprentice in a cell for a few days before they brought him before Tazuk to give them time to rescue him. It was during one of their infrequent rest periods that Martinuk approached them. They'd scattered up and down a narrow tunnel, each of them dropping their packs in the dust and then wearily following them to the ground. Godric had gone on ahead to scout with one of the twins, and so Felix had taken the opportunity to catch up on his writing. He'd been relieved to find that his journal had remained safe in the old leather pouch during the dip in the river, and had just put pen to page when Martinuk sat down beside him. He cut a slice of cheese off a block and offered it to Felix. It was stale, but made the heart attack go down faster, and so Felix took it gratefully. How goes the remembering? asked Martinuk abruptly. Felix studied the page, knowing that the question was probably just one of the niceties of conversation and deserved a flippant answer. Not well, he admitted. Godric's adventures span many years. I find my greatest problem is deciding what parts to leave out. Martinuk grunted. His fingers beat against a block of cheese. Felix could tell the dwarf wanted something from him, but couldn't find the right words. He closed the journal and returned it to the pouch. Was there something you wanted to ask of me? I saved your life back there, the mercenary said gruffly. Felix nodded solemnly. I owe you a great debt, Herr Dwarf. Martinuk nodded as if the matter was settled. Abruptly, he spoke again, though. Why him? Puzzled, Felix spoke slowly. I don't follow. You are Gotrek's rememberer. Why is he worthy of your services? Troll slayers take oaths to end their lives because of some great shame, often a crime they've committed, said Martinuk. Gotrek's a criminal, and yet you sworn an oath to immortalize his deeds in an epic poem. I... Felix stuttered. Though their actions during the window tax riots had made them wanted men across half the empire, he'd never considered the fact that Godric's own race might think of him as a criminal. I suppose I never thought about it that way, he admitted. Godric speaks very little about his past, and has never spoken of the events that caused him to take the slayers of to begin with. And what if those events make him unworthy of an epic? Martinuk said softly. Felix considered this and found that he didn't have an answer. That in itself terrified him. To Felix, Godric's life began on that fateful day in the midst of the riots when he had rescued Felix from the Reichsguard. But dwarves were exceptionally long-lived, and Godric may have lived the equivalent of many human lifetimes before they'd even met. His deeds as a slayer formed the bulk of Felix's epic, but what if the foundation was rotten? What if Felix had spent the last two decades of his life recording the deeds of a criminal? King Grundadrak's words to Godric echoed in Felix's ears. Your name was the last inscribed in the book. Godric had been the engineer in charge of constructing the vault in which the Book of Garages was housed, likely the royal engineer. Had he committed some crime that had gotten him banished out of the barrack? Felix looked up and down the line of dwarves. Likely he was the only one among them who was in the dark about the nature of Godric's great shame. Although curious, he never pressed Godric about its nature, but he resolved to ask again the next time they stopped. The slayer himself came out of the darkness at the end of the tunnel, followed closely by Gromnir. We found a vault said Gromnir excitedly. That's not the right vault, said Balir angrily. The expedition had gathered on a terrace overlooking a great hole far beneath them. The twins had found places at the marble banister, evidently fearless of being seen by whatever was below, while Nori Wolfheim stood with arms folded close to the longbeard. 
Malbach hung back with Ulgar and Tebur Tanilson, near a pile of wood dust that had once been a painting. The sheer volume of the hole amazed Felix. It was nearly a hundred feet deep and several hundreds across. Though it was lit only by scattered torches in iron wall braces, the dwarves could no doubt see to its far recesses. Felix, on the other hand, had some difficulty piercing the gloom, even from their elevated vantage point. A fine layer of rock dust lay everywhere on the floor below them, disturbed by narrow paths of scaven tracks. Paw prints followed by white smudges, where their tails occasionally dragged against the ground. The hole had once been home to a fountain, in the center of which stood a majestic statue of Grimnir, judging from the dual axes. A circle of raised rocks surrounded the statue, forming what might once have been a reflecting pool. It was the kind of fountain that lovers in Altdorf might have cast coppers into as they wished for romance. Of course, thought Felix Riley, dwarves as a race were far too cheap to throw money into puddles, but it was likely that the fountain had served similar romantic purposes. At the far end of the hole was an enormous door, bigger even than the vault of Musin Baldurk. It lay slightly ajar, balanced on steel hinges that reflected the flickering torchlight so well that Felix judged them to be nearly free of rust, a miracle for such an ancient monument. Though Felix stood at the edge of the terrace, it was too dark to see into the next room. Look, said Gromnar, dwarves! Several figures shambled towards the vault in a single file along the far wall. They followed one of the paths the Skaven had beaten through the rock dust. They wore thick grey cloaks stained with the color of iron ore, so that they looked like boulders come into life. They moved with a peculiar gait as if they were in constant pain, but if they'd been tortured, their torturer was nowhere to be seen. They're not dwarves, said Godric with a curse. What makes you say that? Wilfame rubbed his chin as he studied them. Those are iron beard cloaks, unless I miss my guess. They were a small clan that mined a vein of magnetite on the outskirts of Baragvar before the Skaven came. They disappeared in the war. His eyes were grim as he met their gazes. We thought them the first victims of the Ratmen, but now we know they came here instead. Iron beards or not, no dwarf would ally himself with the Skaven, said Martinuk with a curse. Godric nodded agreement, but his brow creased when Martinuk averted his eyes and spat on the ground instead. It was an odd feeling for Felix to encounter someone who treated a slayer not as a hero, but as a criminal. If they joined the rat men, continued Martinuk, then they should be dealt with in the same manner as the Skaven themselves. Axe first. Balir? asked Wolfheim, turning to the Longbeard. What do you know about these dwarves? Balir glowered into the darkness. Maybe the dwarves I shared a cell with were iron beards. But I passed through this hole during my escape, and there were no Dawi then. Something's rotten in Marienburg, said Felix with a scowl. He shrugged when the dwarfs looked at him with a puzzled expression. It's a human saying. It means there is something amiss. Ah, Marienburg is indeed a cesspit den, said Wolfheim. Felix suppressed a sigh. Dwarves were a literal breed and explaining a decent metaphor was often more trouble than it was worth. Gromnar had kept his eyes strained on the column of dwarves. If Gromnir was the tracker, then Gromnar was the scout. He had the keenest eyes of any of them. They got the prisoner. Felix looked where the reckoner indicated. A solitary skaven warrior walked among the ranks of the dwarves. Smaller than average, with a snub nose like an Aldorf bullhound, it clutched its tail in its paws, as if reassured by its presence. Other than this, the Ratman was unarmed and unarmored, although it carried a heavy pack on its back. Felix could see no sign of restraint, or anything at all to keep the Skaven from darting away from the column. 
Maybe the vault is some kind of prison, suggested Gromnir as the column disappeared behind the door. What good would a skaven prisoner be to a dwarf? asked Ulgar. The runesmith looked disgusted by the very suggestion. What would you feed it, other skaven? They have been known to eat their own kind, said Martinuk darkly. There's another one, said Gromnar. An enormous skaven emerged from the open door of the vault, carrying a huge golden hammer embossed with runes. Half again as tall as the dwarves, it was the same monster that Felix had seen clinging to the ceiling at the river ambush. Naked, except for a red crest of fur that ran from its creased brow to the spot where its tail might have once been, its crude tattoos were clearly visible even in the darkness. It paused at the entrance, the glow from the room beyond highlighting its silhouette, and scanned the terrace where the dwarves were hiding. Though Felix thought he felt its gaze on him, it was bright in the hole below and dark on the terrace. It probably couldn't see past the gloom. One moment later, it barked something to those inside in its crude language, and then turned around and lumbered back into the vault, leaving the door ajar behind it. By Grimnir's beard, barked Wolfheim, loud enough that Felix was worried they were overheard, despite the distance. Hey, Skaven Troll Slayer! Everyone looked at Gartrek, clearly expecting some kind of explosion. The Grim Brotherhood was often referred to as a cult, with the Slayer's Oath at the heart. Their markings were sacred, beyond sacred. They defined all Troll Slayers. This Skaven mockery was sacrilege of the highest order. Instead of storming down the stairs, axe bare though, as everyone expected, Gartrek merely narrowed his eyes. Mine, he said quietly. Caution, Slayer, said Ulgar with a dark, rumbling voice. A set of yellow and disfigured eyes belonging to the cave bear skin he wore as a cloak glimmered just above his own. Unless I miss my guess, Tazuk has managed to free at least one of the fabled weapons of Karaktam from its armory. The golden rune wielded by that rat slayer was the flame hammer. Though it may not work properly for a skaven, it will still retain a fraction of its power, and a powerful weapon it is. I will pit my axe against the hammer any day or night, sneered the slayer, unbuckling his axe and swinging it back and forth to test its weight. Remember our purpose, Gotrek, cautioned Nori Wolfheim. We've come to rescue Glorin and find the Book of Grudges. That is not my purpose, growled Gotrek. My doom awaits. And a glorious doom it would be, wouldn't it? asked Martinuk darkly. Die in battle against a few dwarves and a painted rat. You leave an innocent boy like Glorin to fend for himself. You slayers think of no one but yourselves. Gatrek reddened and glared at Martinuk with his one good eye. Did you say something mercenary? You heard me, responded the dwarf, unlimbering his own axe. Thinking quickly, Wulfheim nodded to the twins. Gromnir stepped in front of Gartrek, while Gromnar placed himself squarely in front of Martinuk, each one a wall of solid metal. Dwarves do not fight dwarves when there are skaven nearby, Wulfheim said in a stage whisper. When we get back to Baragvar, you two can gut each other for all I care, but now you'll both be silent. I'll be silent when I'm dead, said Gartrek with a growl, and such was the fury that underlay that tone that Gromnir took a step back, armor or not. The rat slayer is the same creature that led the ambush at the river, Felix quickly interjected. I saw him when he was hoisted to the ceiling. All we have to do to find Glorin is to follow him back to wherever he came from. When were you going to tell me about this rememberer? said Gartrek balefully. 
My eyes are not as good as a dwarf's, countered Felix. I was uncertain of what I was seeing. If there was one thing he'd learned in all his travels with the Slayer, it was that if you ever needed to placate a dwarf, all you needed to do was to appeal to their vanity. The senses of a dwarf were so acute that they tended to think of humans as deaf, blind, and dumb by comparison. To their way of thinking, it wasn't Felix's fault that he hadn't gotten a good look at a rat slayer. He was only a human after all. It seems that you will get your wish after all, slayer, said Ulgar. The runesmith had stepped to the railing and clutched it with both hands. If we find this mad seer Tazuk, then we find my apprentice, and as the manling says, that red-haired monstrosity will lead us right to him.'